I want to open, if you have your um, first, as I always do before I forget, I'd like to take another moment to welcome our visitors, to let you know that we are glad you're here today and we invite you to come and visit with us again. And uh, it is my understanding from what Hurley said, there's memberships available if you're interested in that. <laughs> but in your Ellen White notes and your quarterlies, if you happen to have those and you want to turn with me to page 77, <clears throat> it's the, next to the last paragraph on that page. And it goes like this. It says, The great outpouring of the Spirit of God, which lightens the whole earth with His glory, will not come until we have an enlightened people that know by experience what it means to be laborers together with God when we have an entire wholehearted consecration to the service of Christ God will recognize the fact by outpouring his spirit without measure but this will not be while the largest portion of the church are not laborers together with God God cannot pour out his spirit when selfishness Self-indulgence are manifest. When a spirit prevails that, if put into words, would express that answer of Cain. Am I my brother's keeper? You know, if you were here during Sabbath school, a lot of, a lot of things were talked about. And one of the things that I know that God is telling us we live in the last days of this earth and there is a work to be done. The Bible predicts also that there will be a mighty spiritual revival in the last days, that the Holy Spirit will be poured out in Pentecostal power and that the gospel will be complained or proclaimed, I'm sorry, all over the world. Turn with me now, if you will, to your, our opening scripture reading, Matthew 24 and 14, and Romans 9, 28. <clears throat> I'm trying to slow down to give you a chance to get there. My wife also uh, lets us know sometimes. We go a little fast up here. Um, Matthew 24, 14, are you there? Okay. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached into all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then the end, and then shall the uh, end come. Romans 9, 28 says, For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. Now, these prophecies are telling us a couple of things here, that the gospel is going to be preached into all the world, God will work rapidly to finish this, His work, and then the end will come. We look forward to that. But you see, the devil understands these prophecies probably better than most people on earth. And, just, and so before the coming of Jesus, He's going to work with all of His power. He will introduce His greatest deceptions upon humanity through a counterfeit religious revival of signs and wonders, miracles. The devil will mislead millions and millions of people. Uh, how many here know Mark Finley? You've heard of him, right? You're going to hear a little bit, you're going to hear a lot of Mark Finley in this presentation. But he wrote this in one of his books. He said, the last great deception of Satan will not come from secular human human humanism. It will be a religious deception. The stage is being set today. Crises after crises have rapidly affected our world. Terrorist attacks, natural disasters, political turmoil, and financial uncertainty have, have, have sobered ordinary people. People are looking for answers. Could it be that the devil will introduce a false religious revival to deceive millions? Would, wouldn't it be just like the devil, he says, to attack in an area where most people are not expecting it? If the devil could stir up a false religious excitement as a counterfeit to the genuine revival of the Holy Spirit in latter rain power, he will have accomplished his purpose. 
And Ellen White says this, she confirms this technique when she says, through the agency of spiritualism, miracles will be wrought, the sick will be healed, and many undeniable wonders will be performed. The Great Controversy, page 588. And so Satan will work in great power, but I submit to you God will work in a more powerful way. The Bible describes God's final revelation of glory in Revelation 18.1. He says, And after these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. In this last great revival, the Holy Spirit will be poured out in full power, my friends. The gospel will spread around the world quickly and rapidly. Great numbers of people will respond to the preaching of God's word. Thousands, thousands of people will share the words of life with their neighbors and friends, and we will have responding hearts to that. People are waiting for answers. Do you know anybody right now that's saying, what's going on? Even on television, you hear the newsmen, never had that happen before, never seen that before. This mighty revival that I'm referring to in the Bible is called the outpouring of the latter rain. I want to take a moment here, if you would, and have a word of prayer with me. Would you bow your heads, please? Our Heavenly Father, our Creator, Lord, this morning, as we gather together in your house of worship, we ask you to come and be with us. Fill each one of our hearts with thy Holy Spirit. And Lord, let this message awaken our hearts that we may go forth to do the work the great commission that you've asked us to do and that you will give us the power to do so. Use me this morning, Lord, is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> and this time I brought my own water. <laughs> but <clears throat> in doing this, I've learned too that the early rain and the latter rain refer to part of the agricultural cycle of Israel. In Deuteronomy 11, 14, if you will turn with me to that, Deuteronomy chapter 11 and verse 14. Deuteronomy 11, 14, are you there? Deuteronomy 11, 14. It says, that I will give you the rain of your land in his due season the first rain and the latter rain, that thou may gather as corn in thy, or gather in thy corn and thy wine and thy, oil, and thy oil. The early rain watered the seed that had been planted in the latter rain, of course, fell on it at the end of the cycle to ripen the grain and bring it to full harvest. And we can see by this cycle that's talked about in the Bible and that we've learned here Without the latter rain, there will be no final harvest. The latter rain is one of the Bible's symbols for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the last days. Another sign from God. Acts 2, verse 17. If you can flip over to that one real quick. And if you don't have your Bibles, I'm sorry. Uh, I didn't mention this earlier. There are some directly underneath in, uh, the seats in front of you. And we encourage you to use those also. Acts 2, verse 17. And just the first part of that says, And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith, Lord, saith God, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Now what does that mean to us? The Holy Spirit is going to empower God's people to complete the task of of preaching the gospel to the entire world. The Apostle James puts it this way in James 5, 7, and 8. says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patient for it, until he receive the early and the latter rain. And then in verse 8, he says, Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Old Testament prophet Joel says 
in Joel 2.23 gives us a great promise. He says, Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for He has given you the former rain faithfully, and He will cause the rain to come down for you, the former and the latter rain. And so we can expect the Holy Spirit to do some absolutely incredible things at the end time that we live in. The outpouring of God's Spirit to finish the gospel work on earth will be far more powerful than anything that God's church has ever seen. Ellen White tells us Pentecost will be repeated on a grander and much larger scale. She says the work will be similar to that of the day of Pentecost. As the former rain was given in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at the opening of the gospel to cause the upspringing of the precious seed, so the latter rain will be given at its close for the ripening of the harvest. And then she continues with the great work of the gospel. And I love this part. The great work of the gospel is not to close with less manifestations of the power of God than marked its opening. The prophecies will, which were fulfilled in the outpouring of the, of the former rain at the opening of the gospel are again to be fulfilled in, latter rain, in the latter rain at its close. She continues with this, and this is in the Great Controversy on uh, pages 6, 11, and 12. Servants of God, with their faces lighted up and shining with holy consecration, will hasten from place to place to proclaim the message from heaven. Amen. By thousands of voices all over the earth, the warning will be given. Miracles will be wrought, the sick will be healed, and signs and wonders will follow the believers. Wow. I want to be a part of that. You know, what a thrill it is for us to be living in a time that God des desires to pour out all of heaven's power in the closing of his work. And what a privilege it is for us to be part of that work that he's doing. And I just want to take a moment here to say that being a part of Plymouth Sorrento Church is one of the greatest blessings that I think we can have today as far as church goes. We have a church that works for God. You heard Terry speaking this morning. Um, and I'm going to cover some more of this a little later, but uh, it, it, is a, it is an honor to be part of this church and see what you people do. Renegers Flea Market and all of you that work out there, and I don't know you all. Um, so if I leave out a name, I know Joe's out there. I know that uh, Terry's there, Rosa, Jenny, I don't, uh, <laughs> we went out last week. Glenn was there with his wife, Lenny. Um, <coughs> There's just a lot of work being done. The door-to-door -door ministry that's being done by Dave. Um, it's just amazing. And that's part of the, one of the things that we're going to cover. <coughs> Excuse me. I have a question. If we see the false manifestations of Satan and the counterfeit revival all around us, should we not be longing for the genuine the genuine manifestation of the Holy Spirit in the latter rain power? Should we be seeking God for this manifestation? It's one thing, I believe, to recognize the counterfeit of Satan, but it's all, <laughs> it's all together another to receive the genuine gift of the Holy Spirit from our Father. Is it possible for us to become so focused on Satan's and the deception and the counterfeit of Satan that we fail to recognize what God longs to do through His church today? Is it possible to become so fearful of the false that we miss the showers of the latter rain? Shouldn't we then be longing for the genuine pouring out of the latter rain Holy Spirit? Brothers and sisters, I believe that you know from what Terry spoke of, and I don't see Dave today, uh, and what they're doing with the Bible studies and the people that are responding to those studies. We're getting responsive hearts to the me from the message that are being given by God through, as Terry said, this church. We should take no credit. God's already told us. He's going to speed up the work. 
The Old Testament, Zechariah proclaims this in Zechariah 4, 6. He says, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts, will the work be finished on earth. So what's holding back this revival? What, what, what barriers keep this latter rain from falling from heaven? Why hasn't God poured out his Holy Spirit in all of its fullness yet? What's heaven waiting for? What's wrong? Oh. He's waiting for us. You're right. I found this again in doing this study. What are heaven's prerequisites for receiving the latter rain power of the Holy Spirit? There's nothing more important for us personally, I believe, or for the church as a whole than to be seeking this outpouring of the Holy Spirit in a heaven-sent revival. Selective Messages, Book 1, page 121, Ellen White says this, A revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all of our needs. To seek this should be our first work. There is nothing that Satan fears so much as the people of God shall clear the way by removing every hindrance, so that the Lord can pour out His Spirit upon a languishing church and an impotent congregation. If Satan had his way, there would never be another awakening, great or small, to the end of time. Revival, though, as I've studied, I found begins with one man, one woman, one boy, one girl, on their knees seeking God with all their heart. God's promises for you and I today. He says in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. And throughout history, God has always sent revival in response to prayer of his people. In our day, the long-awaited end-time revival will come. The Holy Spirit will be poured out. The work of God on earth will be finished. And Jesus will return and we will go home. Amen. And may the prayer of each one of our hearts this morning be, Lord, revive us again. So meeting... Heaven's condition for revival and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and latter rain power should be our top priority, Ellen White says. It really seems difficult to maybe believe that the riches of heaven await our demand. All of heaven waits our demand and our reception, and we don't have to wait for it to claim it. We can claim it today, this morning, right now, where we sit, where we stand. So let's take a look at some of these prerequisites. And I believe they're going to put them on just the titles to them on the screen. And if we don't have those, that's okay. The first one, and most of you know this, the first one is to ask God. Zechariah 10.1 said, Ask ye of the Lord reign in the time of the latter reign. It's pretty simple. Are you asking God? In review in Herald on August the 25th of 1896, God's messenger to the last day church said this, We should pray as earnestly for the descent of the Holy Spirit as the disciples prayed at the day of Pentecost. Acts 1, verse 14, Luke records that earnestness, earnestness that they prayed. He said, These all continued in one accord, in prayer and supplication, with the women, and Mary the mother of Jesus and his brethren. The Holy Spirit will only come to us in latter rain power in answer to earnest prayer from us. Ellen White says this in Testimonies, Volume 8, page 23. She sure gives us some great insight of what we need to be doing. She says, My brethren and sisters plead for the Holy Spirit. God stands back of every promise He has ever made. With Bibles in your hands, say, I have done as thou hast said. I present thy promise and ask it, and ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. 
And then Jesus promised us in Luke eleven thirteen, If you be an evil, you know this one, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? He doesn't make it difficult for us. The second of these is an undivided heart. Now, what exactly is an undivided heart? Well, in this case, it's a total dedication to Jesus Christ. A heart that's completely loyal to Him. A heart that longs to do God's will instead of our will. Jesus' life was a model of a life that had an undivided heart and filled with the Spirit. In chapter 3 of Luke, it describes the scene at his baptism where it says, Luke 3.21, if you want to take a look at that or I can just read it to you. It says, while he prayed, the heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily shape like a dove upon him. And then in Luke 4.18, the Savior himself declares, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And at the baptism, his heavenly spot, Father spoke from heaven declaring, You are my beloved Son, and you I am well pleased. So we can see how the Holy Spirit is poured out from heaven on those with whom our heavenly Father is pleased. And Jesus affirmed his heart and his undivided loyalty to God when he declared in John 8, 29, He that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always, always those things that please Him. God's willing to give you and I this morning an undivided heart. We simply need to ask Him to give us a life of absolute dependence upon Him. I think I've shared with you <laughs> A little bit of my life history. I thought I was a pretty good guy. <laughs> Boy, was I a little bit off. No, I was a lot off. You know when you start to understand what God is saying to you in your life, and uh, my brother Pete and I were kind of talking this morning, when you start to really understand what God is saying to you, you do ask for Him to strengthen your own beliefs. Is this real? And when Pete shared in, in Sabbath school what he shared and I talked to him and I said you don't know how thankful I am that I'm not the only one that says Lord help me help me Lord One thing we need to keep in mind as we pray for the outpouring of this Holy Spirit that we're speaking of here is our main focus cannot be for some supernatural power, spiritual power for ourselves. The Holy Spirit is, bears witness of Jesus. That's what it's for. And He asks us to come to Him with humble hearts, putting aside our own desires, saying, not as I will, but as you will. Matthew 26 and 39. And the third of these, and this was mentioned this morning too, and I think it was Martin that had said it back there. I, I don't know if you know I heard, but somebody was speaking. The third of these is saturating our minds with the Word of God. The same Holy Spirit who inspired the Bible inspires us. As we read it. The same Holy Spirit who filled the lives of Bible writers as they wrote the sacred words of Scripture is the same Holy Spirit that inspires us as we read those sacred Scriptures. In Psalms 119, the psalmist gives us some vital keys. I'm going to, there's, there's several verses here, so I'm not going to ask you to turn there. But Psalms 119 and verse 25 says, My soul cleaveth unto the dust. Quicken thou me according to thy word. And then in verse 28, My soul melteth from heaviness. Strengthen thou me according unto thy word. In verse 81, My soul fainteth for thy salvation, but I hope in thy word. He clearly understood that the very foundation of revival is God's word. 
the Holy Spirit flows through God's Word to fill our lives. And to be filled with the Spirit is to be filled with the Word of God. You ever miss a morning where you don't get your studies done? Something happens. It can make a mess of your day, can it? But also, when you do your studies every day and you're saturating your mind with the Word of God, what happens? Satan comes after you. Our story experienced some things last week that we truly know it's because the progress that's being done over there, Satan doesn't like it. Spirit-filled lives are guided by the Word, instructed by the Word, and they are empowered by the Word. When, they, when we absorb the teaching of God's Word, we give the Holy Spirit permission to fill our lives with His presence and His power. And the fourth of these in receiving the Holy Spirit is in the fullness of His power is to put away all dissension between one another. Hmm. You remember the story in the Bible where the disciples were battling for the highest spot? I want to be first. I uh, Put me here. Let me go ahead. The Holy Spirit's power was limited at that time to them. In Testimonies, Volume 8, Ellen White on page 21 gives us this. She says, Let Christians put away all dissension and give themselves to God for saving the lost. Let them ask in faith for the promised blessings, and it will come. The outpouring of the Spirit in the days of the Apostle was the former reign, and glorious was the result, but the latter reign will be more abundant. That's what we need now. And we need to ask ourselves, each one of us, right now, is there anything that stands between me and someone else? Do you need to forgive someone in your life who's hurt you? this morning. And keep in mind, forgiveness is not justifying what another has done that's wrong. It's releasing them from our condemnation when they don't deserve it because that's what Jesus Christ did for us. When we freely forgive, we open our hearts for the Holy Spirit to flow through us to others. The Holy Spirit cannot and it will not forgive I mean, fill an unforgiving heart. It's like oil and water. It will not, it cannot, and it will never mix. And the fifth of these for receiving the latter rain, and this is the part that I am so thankful for here at Plymouth Sorrento, active labor for others. Do we have that here? Praise God we do. And if you remember, he says, and it tells us, this can start with one person. It can be you, it can be you, it can be me, it can be anyone in here on our knees asking God to please fill us with thy Holy Spirit. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit gave the disciples power to witness. That's what this is for. I think I just ought to stick this in my pocket, huh? <laughs> um, God sends his power so that we can proclaim what? His message. He gives it so we can bless others. And ladies and gentlemen, friends, neighbors, brothers, sisters, whatever you prefer to be called, now is the time to seek God for a spiritual revival in this world. And it must begin within the heart of each one of us. I don't know if any of you caught it. I think it was last week or the week before, and I don't know if I get, if I not, and, and maybe somebody can help me, but I think it was somewhere in Europe they gathered together, and guess what they gathered together to do? To set an agenda for a rest day. Guess what that rest day is? It's Sunday, the first day of the week. And they've got great reasons behind it. Economy, health, family. There's all kind of reasons they got. They're all good reasons. I just got the wrong day. But that's what Satan's getting ready to do. We just read that. Satan knows his time is running out. And again, I say to you, 
And as I look out here and I see Terry and I, and I, and I see all these other faces that have been out doing, you know, even my wife and I, uh, I think I shared with this y'all a while back, we have what we call our little U-turn ministry. You turn around and go back and give him a book and have prayer with him. You turn around and go back and help him out. You turn around and do whatever God asks you to do. And that's what we're doing here. The Holy Spirit testifies of Jesus Christ. That being said, I have another question. Why would God pour out his Holy Spirit on us to witness and empower us to share our faith with others if we're not interested in doing so? When we are interested in what the Holy Spirit is interested in, when he will then pour out his Spirit upon this earth. And God invites us to make his priorities our priorities. He urges us to place his will before our own. You've all heard most of what I'm saying up here. Now we have to do what Terry and all these others, all you others are doing. We have to put it in action. We have to quit saying we're going to. One of the greatest disappointments in this world is we're all going to. I, I used to say, my dad used to say, you're going to get around to it. Well, he carried little round to it in his pocket, and that's what it said on there. Here's your round to it. Go do what you're supposed to do. And God invites us, like I said, to make his prior. He urges us to place his will before it. He appeals to us, seek what first? The kingdom of God and his righteousness in all aspects of our lives. Receiving the latter rain calls for total surrender to him. Now's the time to seek with consecrated hearts for this mighty power that only God can give us. What happens in a revival? Hmm. When I was young, I remember tent revivals and things like that. You know, I didn't really know what happened. I just thought it was cool to go there because everybody else was going and didn't get to go to that many. But in revival, the Holy Spirit changes our thinking process. He does a new thing in our lives. There's a new spiritual awakening in our hearts. Spiritual longings fill our souls. We have a hunger for the things of God. How does this spiritual revival occur for us? How are we to become more like Jesus? The Apostle Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians 3.18. If you want to turn with me in your Bibles to that, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. <clears throat> there. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. says this, but we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed in the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Amen. In James 1 verse 21, the Apostle James tells us that we're transformed by the implanted Word of God. Peter declares that we're partakers of the divine nature through God's exceedingly great and precious promises. 2 Peter 1.4 And as we come in contact with Jesus, in His Word, we are transformed. As we meditate upon Jesus in His Word, we are transformed. Revival fires are lit in our hearts. And we are transformed. Desire of Ages, page 83. She says, It would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. We should take it point by point and let the imagination grasp each scene, especially the closing one. Um, I've asked the deacons to... Um, hand out a little gift that Meg and I would like to give you. It's a condensed book about the life of Christ. It's called The Life of the Messiah. Well, I thought I had... Oh, I do have one. 
And it's written by Jerry D. Thomas. It's a very powerful little book. It looks like this. You've probably seen them before. You can carry this with you, and you can read it and read it and reread it. And every time you reread it, give thought to the life of Jesus Christ. Now, don't get into reading these yet. And there's a little prayer in there that I just want you to set these aside because I'm not quite done yet. So just set them aside. And if you, didn't, if you don't get one, there should be plenty for everybody. But I want you to clear your mind, put away every thought that you have in this world, and I want you to imagine something for me for just a moment. Imagine that you were in the upper room with the disciples 2,000 years ago, and you just got a glimpse of your resurrected Lord. And you were filled with faith and hope overflowed in your heart. And he gave you, along with the disciples, what has become known today as the Great Commission. Mark 16, 15. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, we didn't have cell phones and computers back then, did they? But imagine you were just given that Great Commission by God. Would your thoughts be, how am I going to do that? Well, God leaves no stone unturned. He's given you at that point in the upper room a new reason for living. And then he gave you another great promise. And without the great promise that he followed this up with, you could not fulfill the great commission. And just imagine, just imagine you're in that room and Jesus Christ is standing there. The integrity of God's word is at stake. His reputation is on the line. And the honor of God's throne depends on the fulfillment of his promise to us. To you and the disciples that day. And despite all the overwhelming obstacles and the insurmountable odds that you knew you faced, you and those disciples clung to that promise as we should today. Acts chapter 1 and verse 4, Jesus. Jesus even commanded them at that point that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. Verse 5 of that same chapter, You shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. In verse 8, Here's the promise. But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Judea, Jerusalem and all of Judea and in Samaria and into the uttermost parts of the earth. You see, God not only gave us a commission, he gave us a way to do it. And that's all we have to do this morning is ask him. In closing... I want to propose two questions to you. Is the greatest desire of your life and your heart this morning to be filled with his love and this great power that he offers? Do you long for his blessing and the great promise that he just gave us in Acts 1? He's ready to pour out the abundant blessings of heaven upon you and I right now today. I'm going to ask you to take out the little green cards of your book. And I want us today to do what the disciples did 2,000 years ago. Be in one accord in this room. It's a little prayer. Just look at it. I'm going to pray it. And we'll have a closing hymn and I'll have closing prayer. But just look at this. And I'll pray it and read along. Just bow our heads. Dear Jesus, I surrender all. I give all you ask. And by faith... Receive all you have promised. Lord, you've promised acceptance, forgiveness, redemption, deliverance, adoption, hope, and power. By faith, I claim your promises at this very moment and believe the Holy Spirit's blessings are upon me at this very moment. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. If you prayed that prayer, I encourage you to take those little cards with you and pray that prayer daily and let Plymouth Sorrento Start, along with many probably other churches, the outpouring of God's latter rain power.